Welcome to this episode of the Heartbeat for Hire podcast. I feature Olympians, CEOs, disruptors, authors, professional athletes, and the best of the best, where they share their stories of resilience with my lens on leadership and culture. Let's get started. Greetings and welcome to this episode of the Heartbeat for Hire podcast. Three things you are going to learn from this episode today is one, why HR needs a seat at the table. Two, how the smartest and most profitable companies leverage their HR teams. And three, the biggest mistakes leaders are making right now regarding their culture. Steve Cadigan is my guest today, and he is a highly sought after talent advisor to leaders and organizations across the globe. As founder of his own Silicon Valley based firm, Cadigan Talent Adventures, sorry, Cadigan Talent Ventures, Steve advises a wide range of organizations that include Google, Cisco, Intel, the Royal Bank of Scotland, Manchester United Football Club, Salesforce, the BBC, and more. He is also regularly retained by some leading VC and consulting firms such as McKinsey, Deloitte, Greylock Partners, and more. He's a keynote speaker, an author, and professor, and was the first CHRO for LinkedIn. Steve, welcome to the show. Lindsay, so great to be here. Yeah, looking forward to this. Oh, me too. Um, so I start every show the same way, and I always ask my guests, can you please tell us your story? Sure. Well, uh, I guess I'm coming to you today as sort of a recovering human resources executive. <laughs> I graduated <laughs> school. You're okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I graduated school as a history major and I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life when I went to school and had no idea what I wanted to do when I graduated. I had a father, have a father who's a minister and my mom is a social worker. And I was raised in a home where business is sort of like, no, we don't do that here. Mm. Uh, I have a sister who's an ordained minister, uh, another sister who is a creative writer and a brother who's an artist. And so I am the one that's sort of like, what happened to him? You know, where did we, oh, go, where did wrong? we go wrong? <laughs> you know, yeah. What babysitter did we choose for him that we didn't choose for the other one? So I, you know, I finished school and all I knew at that point in my life was that I didn't want to ask the United Way for money like my parents are doing the rest of my life. I wanted to be the person United Way was coming to say, you know, we'd like you to contribute. I want to have more control. Um, and from all the volunteer and the summer jobs I'd had in those sort of nonprofit organizations, I was really going crazy with sort of consensus decision making. Like I didn't like to be in that environment. And so I just accidentally through my network found an opportunity at a fashion company in San Francisco that uh, was called the Spree. It was really hot at the time. And I was doing credit and collections. And after doing that for a year, they said, do you want to go into recruiting? Because, you know, the company was rotating people around. I said, sure. What is that? And they said, you interview people and you you see if they're a good fit. And I thought, you're going to pay me to do that? Because <laughs> that sounds really fun, you know? <laughs> And here I am in a, I moved to San Francisco from Connecticut and I didn't know anybody, literally nobody. Uh, and so I thought, wow, what a great place for me to sort of try something new. And I didn't know if I liked it. I didn't even know what human resources was, honestly, at the time. All my summer jobs were like teaching tennis, construction, framing sure. houses, being a janitor. I'd done nothing in the business world. So this was just a new like buffet table and I had never tasted all these different roles and I got really lucky, Lindsay, because I fell in love right away. And what I found in recruiting and then taking on a little bit more in the domain of HR, you know, employee referral programs and then uh, new employee orientations and then, you know, benefits, open enrollment. Uh, and then you get into um, dispute resolution and employee relations. Everything I found HR had was everything I loved about sports. And I love uh, as a sports fan, I love playing sports, but I really love watching how people handle different situations, right? Like who handles uh, being in a pressure situation? Who needs pressure to perform? Who handles certain kinds of bosses? And here I am in an organization whose entire existence is to fulfill everything I loved about sports. It's like mapping people in the right environments to produce great outcomes, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I was there for about four years and in increasing levels of, uh, you know, exciting roles in the HR world. Then I moved to insurance and I did that for four years. Then I moved to high tech in 91. Um, no, I'm sorry, 94, I moved to high tech. Uh, so about eight years in, I worked at a company called AMD. And that's when my head exploded because what high tech offered was just dynamic decision making and a much more enlightened view of talent. And I thought, wow. And at that point, I said, I want to do this the rest of my life. 
So mm-hmm. I got a master's degree while I was working uh, through a University of San Francisco master's of HROD. And I said, I want to do this for the rest of my life. I went to school with a purpose. I loved it. I'm all in. And after being finishing the degree, I went to Cisco Systems. And at the time, Cisco was prolifically acquiring companies all over the world. And I was asked to grow, lead, and build the acquisition integration team. So we're, you know, hey, we bought these 400 people in Italy. Go figure it out. And I would do that. And so we flew all over the world. And I was just, you know, so fun. I, still relatively young at this point. And I was just a kid in a candy store. Just loved it. Uh, high velocity change. Uh, so I did that until the dot-com bubble burst. And then they, uh, my job was pretty much eliminated. And they sent me to Singapore to lead HR for all of Asia. So I did that. Loved it. Loved yeah. it. Uh, and when they said, come back, I said, I don't want to come back. And they said, you have to come <laughs> back. I said, I don't want to come back. And so I quit and moved and took a job in Canada. Mm-hmm. That is my first head of HR for a small chip company uh, in Vancouver. Love it. Uh, Vancouver, to this day, it's one of the few career regrets I have is leaving that job and leaving uh, Vancouver. Um, had my first uh, son in when we lived in Singapore. And then I had a set of twins in Canada. You can always tell the twins because they're a little cold to the touch. Um, <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> And then after about four years in Canada, which I absolutely loved, um, Electronic Arts uh, recruited me to come back to the U.S. And I was ready at that point because raising kids internationally without your yeah. family support network for my wife and I, tough. Yeah. So came back, settled in the same town as my mom, um, which did factor into, into that in, uh, in Menlo Park, California. And very soon after coming back to the States, I realized that that job really wasn't right for me at EA and uh, got fortunate enough to be recruited as the first head of HR at uh, at LinkedIn. And that was just a complete game changer for me in terms of practicing your craft in a place that's making products for your profession, enabling you to be a product advisor, uh, product manager, and to be a sales leader traveling all over the world to boardrooms of JP Morgan and Walmart selling LinkedIn. Um, and meeting these amazing people. Uh, and so I took uh, that first HR hire by LinkedIn and was the company was 400. We took it to 4,000 in the next four years, two offices to 26, two countries to 17. I, I'd never managed more than like a dozen people. Now I've got like 300 people on my team. Yeah. It was the adventure of a lifetime, equally terrifying uh, and and um, exciting. Um, oh my gosh. And so I left that about 10 years ago because the four years felt like 20. Yes. And uh, I just took a breath and I was able to, from that, parlay that into just starting to build my own practice. Yeah. And all I was really, I had no plans after I left LinkedIn other than to just take a breath and hopefully not lose the rest of my hair. Yeah. And um, I started getting lots of inbounds saying, can you help us with hyper growth? Can you help us with culture? Can you help us with you know, building a great organization? And that's sort of become my life's work in the last uh, dozen years or so. And then Three years ago, um, after speaking at so many conferences around the world and people saying, where's your book? Uh, I said, it's right here. I decided to take time out right before COVID and I wrote a book and I pushed it out right in the middle of COVID. And that's opened even more doors for me to be able to talk about the future work. Yeah. Yeah. And we're going to talk about the book, but you said my favorite word, which was culture. So let's start there. Um, One of the things we said at the top was that we were going to talk a little bit about the role of culture and what companies are, are what are they viewing culture as now on a level of importance? What are you seeing? I know you're talking to tons and tons of leaders. Is this a concern? Is this an area they're paying attention to and who's doing it well? Yeah. You know, culture, someone said what culture eats strategy for breakfast. You've heard oh, that yeah. one. Oh, yeah. And then I saw a great quote recently was like, then why is uh, culture starving? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, it's so true. I think, yeah, I think, listen, um, yes, I think a lot of people do get it. Uh, I think that that's more the exception than the norm. And I I never really, in building a whole career in human resources, talking about the value and the power of culture, I never really saw that to be true until I landed at LinkedIn. Mm. So and here's, here's how, and it wasn't because we were smart that culture is important. It was because we were desperate. And mm. let me explain the, the backstory. We're a recruiting company. When I was joining LinkedIn, that was our biggest product. And our biggest organizational shortfall was recruiting. <laughs> we were not succeeding. We're in the garden of Silicon Valley 
and Apple and Facebook and Google and Twitter could outpay me, outperk me, out work environment me, out Lady Gaga's coming for breakfast and LeBron James yeah. is going to shoot free throws with our staff. And, you know, my uncle Joe's coming for breakfast. Like we had nothing <laughs> and I couldn't pay and I couldn't, you know, keep up with that. Yeah. So at some point after so many offers were declined, we finally got to the point where we we're like, you know what, we're going to have to, um, you know, we're going to have to figure out what competitive advantage we actually have here mm -hmm. because we can't compete on all these domains. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, after offer decline, offer decline, finally we had a, you know, a gathering of all the leaders one, one day and it was basically an all day meeting. And I said, Steve, you're failing, you know, you're not, your team's not able to recruit all these people. And I said, well, you guys got to give me something because we got nothing. You know, I, we have no benefits. We have no you know bonus program. We have nothing. And every company's making more money in a day than we make in a year. So I can't afford all those things. So, uh, and that's when you know, our head of sales, this amazingly brilliant guy, Mike Gamson, and I started to get into this discussion saying, well, what we can do and what we should do and what we have to do because we're LinkedIn is if we're a professional network, we should be the best place anyone's ever worked. Yeah. Let's commit to be this being the greatest job anyone's ever had. And it was, we, we sort of woke up and said, that's our birthright. We, yeah. We're LinkedIn. We should be the best place anyone's ever worked. And so we doubled down on that and started saying, listen, we can't pay you what Google's paying you. We can't have the sushi bar over there. We can't build a, a law, you know, a, an ADU for your in-laws after you have your first child and get you that free baby stroller. But we can assure you that this will be the most interesting job and most career growth of your life. Do you want to join? And that started to tip the scales. Yeah. And we started to simplify instead of a culture like these are the seven pillars of our culture. These yeah. are the 13 values that we have. We're like, no, career transformation. And you know what was the tipping point, Lindsay, was that we finally, and this is so powerful. If you can be an organization, you can figure out this harmony. It was beautiful. What we were doing for our customers is the same thing we're doing for our employees. We're helping our customers transform their careers. We should be helping our employees transform their careers. Now that's yeah. easy to understand, easy to process, right? And that was yeah. the big turning point for us. Yeah. Well, and that that's one of like so the person that I think that does this the best and who's maybe been the most outspoken about this is Richard Branson. Sir Richard Branson. He has always had the belief of I take care of my people, they take care of our clients. And the companies that I think do the best have inspired teams that perform. And they have a, a population of people that are willing to try hard, willing to go the extra mile, excited to innovate, collaborate, communicate. All of those things mm. happen when you invest in your people. And for any leader that thinks culture is an afterthought or a nice to have, listen to Steve. He will tell you it was a game changer. And I imagine you're going to say that how were the results after you doubled down on culture? Yeah, phenomenal. And and a couple of little things that we did. We began every interview by saying, what do you want to be doing when you leave the company? Because we know you're going to go. So how can we help get that. you there while you're here? Number one. So see, we're starting to care about you for your whole career. Yeah. We're not just caring about you. And that's where I think people get culture wrong a lot is like, oh, uh, culture is just in the walls of our buildings. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Culture is a relationship that you have to create, you know, uh, sort of, uh, you know, high performance beyond when I someone is that. just just with you. But we started to do things like every training program that I delivered, I had my executives deliver. And so what that did was it gave my all my employees, especially as we're growing, and the sense of, oh, I'm just a cell in a spreadsheet and there's all these layers between me and the sure. executives, it, it, it bridged that gap. And they got to see my leaders. And I said, teach whatever you want. I don't care. I want my employees to see you loving what you're doing. Yeah. So it gave uh, proximity and it built trust. We, we never communicated important company news in an email. It was always in an all hands meeting. Yeah. And we did that a lot. Um, and that built trust, you know, yeah. and we measured the quality of our staff meetings by who's asking the elephant in the room questions, you know? And so those are little things that we did in lots of different ways that supported this is going to be the best environment you've ever been in. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I love, I mean, we could just spend the entire podcast on this topic but we have other things to discuss. So let's talk about why you believe, and I believe too, HR needs a seat at the table. Well, listen, uh, one of the things that uh, a lot of, it's super simple. If you ask any business leader, how do you create value? They're going to say, well, it's my people. 
So then I always love to ask, so are the best systems in your company, the people systems? Is it the number one agenda item in every meeting that you have because people are creating value? And it's usually, no, it's the sales targets. Mm -hmm. It's the engineering roadmap. Yep. It's the, you know, the new tech stack. It's the, you know, competitive environment. And I think we're, we're missing that, right? We're, we're really missing that. And so, you know, I think the best work I've ever done in HR isn't because I was the smartest guy or had the best team. It's because my leaders co-owned the HR agenda with me. Yeah. And that's what I had un unbeknownst to me when I joined LinkedIn. That's what I had there. I had a team of leaders that knew more what they didn't want from HR than what they did want. But what they knew they did want was a great high performing culture. Right. And yeah. we all had different views on how to realize that, but we, we collaborated in that. And I think what a lot of leaders don't understand is staff will feel candid and safe most of the time to share something with HR. And if you don't set that team up to be high integrity and to be trusted, um, then you're not going to hear mm -hmm. stuff and it's going to bubble up like a volcano and then it's going to explode like you saw happen at Uber, like you've yep. seen happen in lots of places where suppress, suppress, mm -hmm. suppress. Mm -hmm. But I will say this because I get triggered a lot at, at conferences. I'll speak at and like, hey, Steve, you know, uh, I'm in HR. How, how do we get a seat at the table? And I said, listen, there's a lot of organizations that don't want you to have a seat at the table. Right. They don't want to hear you challenge their decisions. They don't want, you know, to have you advocate for what's right. They want you to just do what they tell you to do. And that happens, right? Yeah. And so, but I truly think like, if, if you really care about realizing the best outcome for your organization with the right HR talent, you can, you can see one plus one equals five. Like yeah. you really get it right. You're going to see something that you don't normally see. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of examples mm -hmm. of high performing HR. Most leaders I talk to know what they don't want from HR than what they do want because they've not yeah. seen it. Well, it's, it's amazing. I mean, in, in the 20, five plus years that I was in the corporate world, I had one, exactly one leader invite our HR partner to a, a sales meeting. And I looked at her and I said, why are we inviting him? Not because I was challenging her, but I wanted to understand her, yeah, her thought behind it. And she's like, he's a part of our team. And how can I ask him to do his job if he doesn't know us? And I mm -hmm. was like, duh. Why, why has nobody else thought of this? What, what is wrong with the other leaders yeah. that they only want HR in a reactive position? And mm -hmm. I think when you take HR, their power away, that's all they can be. And then they only become loyal to the managers. So it's not a true safe environment. And I've seen and witnessed so many times where people think they're going into this safe space and then they lose their job a week later. And yeah. it's... um going to HR was like the kiss of death. If you were in sales, you, you only did that if you were being sexually harassed or mm -hmm. if you felt threatened in some way, shape or form. And right. what a shame to waste yeah. all of that talent and all of that ability for a reactive moment. I, I think yeah. that's, it's like, um, and some organizations do this. They make HR the penalty box and HR, yeah. they make HR deliver the tough news. So yeah. management doesn't want to you know, take the hit for it. So, oh, HR, you go tell people we're going to lay people off. Like, well, that was your choice. I'm just implementing your decision. But, oh, okay. yeah. you know, and I'll give you, you know, HR takes a hit a lot for weak leadership. You know, and I always say, well, no question. you know, I do a lot of postings on, on TikTok and uh, there's a lot of uh, HR hate out there, if you will. And I, and my first response is, you know, if you don't like the HR, you think they're low integrity, who hired them? Who mm -hmm. thinks that that's good HR? It's yep. their leadership. So if you don't have good HR, it's a leadership mark it's not the hr quality mark you know and i'll give you an example of like how hard the profession is because you've got two goals in hr constructively build the organization and compliance like make okay. sure like we're not harassing okay. people and if someone does have a complaint it's treated fairly and okay. constructively and with gravitas and that's hard to get your leaders to trust you when they know okay. You're the one who who's you know their career could be on the line and you could be someone who's going to have an influence over that yeah. That really put puts a, a you know a difficult balance on it, and it takes a very mature person to be able to play both roads. I, I I've said this before. HR is about two things: credibility and judgment. If mm -hmm. you're not credible, no one cares about your judgment, and if you don't have good judgment, you won't be credible. And that is hard to do unless you've got you know some pattern recognition and you've had some stripes. Like initially in HR, like if you're asked to let someone go and you've never let someone go before, 
How are you going to give advice on doing that? Well, mm-hmm. you're going to go ask someone who's done it and have them give you advice so that you can sort of learn your way through it. But a lot yeah. of times I'll get manager. This has happened a hundred times in my career. Manager comes in and says, we need to fire Lindsay. And I go, why? Oh, Lindsay's just not performing. <laughs> and then I say, okay, so does Lindsay know that, uh, she's not performing? And they go, oh yeah, she knows. Like she's getting skewered in our staff meeting. She's delivered everything late. I said, no, does she know? Have you told her that if she if she's performing so poorly, she could lose her job? And the manager go, why would I tell her that? She's going to get all emotional. I said, well, is that the culture you want? You want a drive-by termination culture. So I could just come to you tomorrow and say you're fired. And you'll say, well, you never told me it was so bad. Is that what you want? And they go, oh yeah, no, that's not what I want. I said, and that's the check balance. And that doesn't make me friends with that manager because mm-hmm. I'm, I'm calling them out. I'm holding yeah. a mirror up and I'm saying, you're gonna have to do something really uncomfortable. I'm going to help you, yeah. but that's not the culture we want here. I'm not going to give you the easy out just to terminate someone in a, you know, drive by night shooting here. You can't well, do it. Good for you for pushing back because I really believe that leadership is there. There's title. Of course, there's power. A lot of people abuse that. But with all of the good things about leadership, there is the tough stuff. And every leader has to deliver those tough messages. So for me, I did have to lay people off, which I hated. And I swore I was never going to get good at it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they gave you a script. And they said, this is what you have to do. And this is, don't, don't deviate from the script. Don't say you're sorry. Like there was a lot of stuff that you had Mm. to say. And for me, I was a leader who always led with heart. And when I'm consistently giving the same messages over and over again, the day that I have to deliver that tough message, they already know who my character is. They already know what I'm about. And do you know how many people Steve said to me, I'm so sorry you have to do this. Mm -hmm. Like I'm laying you off. You're about to lose your job and you're apologizing to me. Wow. Like that, that was really um, amazing to hear, but broke my heart at the same time. Like the, the whole, the whole process is brutal. Um, But they also knew it was a script. They knew it wasn't my words because they knew that I sounded different, but um, yeah. And that's a credit to, you know, having the gravitas, having the empathy, Yeah, you know, to appreciate what someone's going through. We, we, I mean, I've done so many trainings on terminations and so forth, but one, one time, you know, uh, as usual, a really important manager was busy, so they couldn't attend the, the layoff training. Oh. And one of the key things we said in the layoff training is never say, I know how you feel. Do mm-hmm. not say that. Mm-mm. So we're letting someone go. I'm sitting with this leader and I had to sort of, you know, they missed the training. And what do they say? Uh, exactly. I know how I told you them feel. not to say. And the person stood up and started yelling and throwing stuff at the manager. Like, you don't know how I feel. You don't know all the bills I have, my disabled husband, how this is going to affect my life. And he just went white as a ghost. I'm like, don't you ever, ever miss the training in the future. You know? <laughs> yeah. When, when we had to do big layoffs, it was required. And mm-hmm. if you didn't show up, you got like a black mark. And then you yeah. had to go to like the the bad person's training. <laughs> so you missed it. But it was like, it's 8 p.m. You're still coming to the training because you you cannot miss this. And, you know, that was a mandatory thing, but brutal. All right. So let's move to a little sunnier topic. Let's talk about your book because yeah. it's so good. And I, I just got it last night. So I didn't have a chance to like dig mm-hmm. in deep. But tell mm-hmm. everybody what is Workquake about? And then I have a question from the book. Sure. You know, over the course of my career, just like a lot of uh, the listeners here, you know, we see things that are broken. We see an architecture that's uh, not built to withstand the current conditions. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what I saw. You know, you've got a real like it's like you're a mechanic uh, looking at the engine of a car all the time. You just see I know this is wrong. It's not working, but sometimes I don't always know a better way to fix it. And so I was increasingly frustrated with a broken model of work where both employers and employees are increasingly frustrated, dissatisfied. And what I wanted to do was say, listen, I think there's some simple things we could do to create a more satisfying reality for employees and employers. And I I set the book into two parts. The first part is for employees and the second part's for employers because I'm like, hey, both parties are going to need to work together Mm -hmm. to forge a better, more fulfilling relationship. And I really looked at that book as sort of like, let's start a conversation. I'm not the, you know, I'm not a sage. I'm not a know-it-all. But here's what's broken, obviously. And, you know, for example, caring, only caring about people when they work for you instead of caring about them for the whole tenure of their career. Like, why, why do we do that? Why do we go Tony Soprano on people when they quit and you say, you're dead to me, you know, I don't yeah. want to talk to you again. 
when, especially if you're in B2C and they could be a customer of yours after they stop working for you. And so I want to suggest different uh, methods, give tons of examples of people and companies doing some real pioneering stuff that, you know, uh, other folks can do. And, yeah. you know, especially that the first um, section about people, there's some great stories. Uh, and that's what I want to like. I love telling stories. And there's a great story of a woman who a uh, Spanish woman that I met who uh, realized when her daughter was about three or four, like something's wrong. She's not playing with her toys. Uh, and and it went all over the world with her husband, who was a fireman, and she was an executive, I think, with L'Oreal. Yeah. It went all over the world to try to find what is uh, you know going on with our child. How how come she's different? And they finally found someone that said, you know, with the condition that your daughter has, and it's too long for me to uh, pronounce correctly, she will learn if you make YouTube's for her. Right. YouTube's for her on how to play with a doll or whatever. And so her husband happened to be pretty good with video equipment. She starts developing this uh, character called the strawberry fairy with all kinds of makeup for years and years. Her daughter doesn't know it's her mom that's doing this. And two or three years after making dozens and dozens of videos, not only does her daughter start talking for the first time in two languages, she uh, flies one day from, from like Madrid to San Francisco for a vacation. And when they land, all of a sudden she's got millions of views on her YouTubes and now she's a YouTube sensation. And that is just like, discovery through a family crisis to try to address the special needs of her daughter. Now she's got games companies coming to her saying, would you market our product on your, on your next strawberry fairy show? And she's like, well, I think I can replace my whole Income. career. Yeah. And this is really exciting. And she was a digital transformation expert with L'Oreal, which is a really cool job. And she's getting paid a ton of money, but she's like, this is, this is my calling, you know? And that is, you know, so many people I know feel stuck in their career, feel like they're really miserable. But it's many of my friends who got laid laid off or had some sort of life event forced them to do something different, and they're way happier. Super interesting. Yeah. Oh, I love that story. And I, I did see it in there. I just haven't been able to really immerse myself yet. So yeah. let me ask a different question. Mm. Um, what inspires you? What inspires me? I think right now uh, in the world that I see, it's the people who are willing to experiment. Um, we have so many unknowns in front of us right now in the world of work. So many uh, new challenges, you know, artificial intelligence is coming at us, employee turnovers up, employee engagements down. Um, there's this whole hybrid, you know, tug of war that's going on. People want to work from home. There's as a leader, it's like, man, this is a lot of stuff. And I think it's a time where I starting seeing more and more organizations say, you know what, let's experiment a little bit. So let's take Chipotle. Chipotle said a couple of years ago, something I've never heard a company say. And, and, and I talk about it a little bit in my book. They said, we know we're not your dream job. We're fast food. We know we're not your destination. We want to be the best part of your journey. So come here. We will invest in you. We will teach you things and we will help you get to where you want to go. Yeah. Seeing their employment experience as a fast food restaurant, as a vessel, so yeah. inspiring to me, so yeah. inspiring and, and being open and honest, you know, like yeah. so many companies will say, you commit, come here and commit to stay for a long time and we'll commit to employ you a long time. We both know we probably won't uh, follow up on either commitment, but let's start a relationship on a false premise. You know, why, why, right? Oh, God. Well, and it's funny. I mean, in the landscape of job hopping, I'm a dinosaur. Like, there's nobody that stays at a company for 20 years anymore. Um, everybody bounces. And I think in your book, you talk about, you know, you were at EA for 15 months. And mm -hmm. that is a short stint for an yeah. executive. And though there wasn't a contract, you having this unwritten agreement with your boss and having to break that to go to LinkedIn was really a struggle. And yeah. that exactly what you said, that premise of, well, you're going to stay for that forever, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, no, yeah. you're staying forever anymore. You, there's no such thing as job security. So you have to like find what's right for you. Um, That's right. Okay. So another question, what would you like your legacy to be? I think uh, I like my legacy to be, I hope it is shaping up, is that, you know, I helped open the eyes for people to see a more satisfying, rewarding future that they didn't see before. 
And the best compliments I get after I give a talk are, whoa, those are some of the freshest ideas I've ever heard. Thank you. I never thought of it that way. You know, and I'm not trying to be provocative or trying, I'm trying to push. I'm just trying to sort of say, here's the data. Like, do you think people are going to stay in companies long in the future? Nope. Okay. Well, why are we pretending they're going to do that then? Let's act on it and expect people won't stay as long like they do in college sports, like they do in you know college basketball. We know the best players are only going to stay one year. So let's rethink our recruiting strategy. So we're always recruiting great people. Yeah. Let's think about caring about that person if they don't make the NBA and say, you can come back as a coach, as a broadcaster, as an analyst, a summer camp okay. counselor, whatever. Um, and that, that really, um, I hope becomes my legacy that I helped reshape the thinking of how people think about talent. Well, I think you're already on your way and there's so much in the book that covers that. And plus your ability to teach at the collegiate level and speak to people. I think it's just wonderful. Um, so what's next for Steve? Uh, next, I'm writing another book right now. Yes. And I um, I tell you what, all these tools out there with uh, perplexity and chat GPT, the research that I have access to, the speed for me to be able to find Amazing. a great quote. Uh, and just recently, like six months ago, my biggest frustration is there's so much rich knowledge on podcasts but you couldn't search it on chat GPT or perplexity. Yeah. Now you can. Well, and now it's like, Oh, this is great. So I'm super excited to get this next one. And just to uh, quickly get to the punchline. One of the crazy things about living in Silicon Valley is that this is just a nutty place. It's just crazy here, but I don't think anyone can argue. There's more people doing things they've never done before here than anywhere else in the world. And there's more creativity, yeah. innovation, market cap value creation than anywhere in the world. And that's something that I want to unlock mm -hmm. and expose and shine a light on that we have over indexed on putting people in jobs because of experience and not yeah. recognize the energy that I saw at LinkedIn where we had half the companies doing stuff they've never done before yep. and yep. we're crushing it. Yep. You know, and I, and it took me about a decade Lindsay, to sort of like, how do we do that? Because yeah. we had all these people where uh, are out of position, but I, yet, I, mm. You know, I, I love that. And I got to, I got to lead an organization like that. Um, and, and it was totally based on the fact that they had psychological safety. They knew if they screwed up, it was going to be okay. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I called them Mavericks and hustlers. I wanted, I wanted them to think differently. I wanted them to be weird. I wanted us to try mm -hmm. stuff nobody had done before. And we did, and we crushed our numbers quarter over quarter. And everybody looked at us like, what the hell are they doing over there? And and I was so proud of that. So proud of yeah. that. But we had yeah. autonomy, we had inspiration, we had collaboration. It was it was phenomenal. So mm -hmm. cheers to that. I'm all Great. for it. Well, I need to follow up so I can get you in my book because that's <laughs> those are the kinds of examples I need to hear. It'd yeah. be my pleasure. Great. So what's next for you? Uh, next for me uh, right now is I've got two juniors in high school and, I, and, and we are like finishing the college search process. Yeah, same. <laughs> uh, and I love college campus tours. Like I could, if there's a way that I could parlay that into a full-time job, the energy being in these environments where exciting things are possible is just such a wonderful environment to be in. I agree. So I am you know, locking arms with my twin boys as we go through this, uh, super excited for them and just hoping they don't feel the pressure to sort of answer the question, which every school asks, which drives me crazy. It's like, mm -hmm. so what do you want to, what do you want to do? What do you want to study here? I'm like, no, you should be asking, what do you want to explore here? Or what because, can I study? Yeah. Right, they don't know. How and we're they? forcing them to have to make, into, make a, make a choice. Right. But so that's the sort of the big, huge thing for me right now. I yeah. Love it. I love it. And how can people find you, Steve? Uh, I've got a, a website, stevecadigan.com. Uh, obviously on LinkedIn, I hear it's a pretty good platform. You could find me there. Uh, and uh, I have a TikTok channel in my name. Excellent. Yeah. Well, I am so grateful that you came on the show and shared your wisdom. This has been an absolute delight. Guys, if you liked what you heard, please subscribe to the YouTube channel or go out to Spotify or Apple, leave a five-star review. These reviews and your subscription are so important to keeping this show going and having great guests. So, uh, I hope you enjoyed it, Steve. You've been a pleasure. Thank you so, so much for everything you shared. You guys, have a great day. Go lead with heart. Thanks for listening. Are you ready to elevate your leadership style and create an exceptional workplace that stands out from the crowd? I'm here to introduce you to a game-changing resource 
that will transform the way you lead and shape your company culture. It's time to embrace the power of top-down culture. This practical guide empowers your leadership for lasting success, helping you create a workplace where everyone thrives. Get top-down culture today, and let's reshape the future of leadership together. Thanks for listening to this episode of Heartbeat for Hire. I hope you enjoyed what you heard. If you did, please subscribe to my YouTube channel or consider leaving a five-star review and a great rating at Spotify or Apple. Thank you so much for your support. Have a great day.